I'm going to start with a confession. I've worked in educational publishing for almost 40 years, and I'm still here. And every so often, a manuscript lands on my desk that rocks my world. Street Data was one of those manuscripts. It shifted my perspective on equity and schooling in general and forced me to question the manner in which we measure our impact as educators. To put it bluntly, I had to come to terms with the fact that I too had swallowed the econometric Kool-Aid, that perhaps it is time to question the deeply rooted assumption that what is measurable, what is quantifiable, is all that matters. I now know that there are different ways of making meaning of our world. I'm not going to delay today's session with lengthy introductions to the authors of Street Data. Suffice it to say that both Shane Safir and Jamila Dugan are superb educators, leaders, writers, and professional learning facilitators. I was an admirer of Shane's first book, The Listening Leader, a book that has been widely acclaimed by both scholars and practitioners. I was lucky enough to be chosen as the steward of street data. Jamila has also worn many hats, including a distinguished career as a teacher, a leadership coach, and a researcher. Finally, I admit to being a bit starstruck and at a loss for words in the presence of our two special guests, Chris Empton and Jal Mehta. I'll leave it to Shane and Jamila to introduce them. Without further ado, my beloved authors, teachers, and friends, Shane Sapir and Jamila Dugan. Wow, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are, whichever time zone. I'm really moved by that introduction, Dan. You have been a champion and an editor of our dreams, and I could not thank you enough for the ways that you've um, helped us give birth to this book and this project. I'm so excited to be here with you all. We are up at like 400, near 400, and still growing this group. And we thank you for taking time out today to spend time with us, to engage with these ideas uh, that are kind of fresh off the press. And um, <clears throat> I couldn't be more honored to share this platform with my dear friend and colleague, the brilliant writer and thinker, Dr. Jamila Dugan, who will introduce herself in a moment. <laughs> um, and so uh, we want to begin actually uh, before this by acknowledging that it is Teacher Appreciation Week. And we thank every teacher, every educator, every pedagogue who's out here just doing the work, whether you're online, hybrid, in the building. Uh, we see you, we value you, we thank you. Woohoo, teachers, I see Crystal saying in the chat. And, and just a deep appreciation for all you do and for hanging through one of the toughest years one could imagine. I'm married to a teacher, a high school teacher. and. Oh, it's been a year. So thank you all. We see you and value you and honor you today. I um, want to begin by acknowledging that Jamila and I are gathered today on the traditional and unceded territories of the Ohlone people, myself here in Oakland, California, the Bay Area, and the Lenape people of Philly, where Jamila is stationed, and invite you to take a moment to reflect on the land that you're on and the First Nations people who have tended that land for thousands of years, raised their families, modeled um, brilliant community and relationality and ways of learning and knowing together that really show up in this book. Um, and if saying that makes you think, huh, I don't know much about the First Nations people of the land I live on, then I invite you to articulate maybe an inquiry question for yourself. How could I know a little more? How could I pay a little more homage to the folks who have been here um, for so long and share community and space with us? And I love this quote from Canadian Indigenous author and our colleague, Elaine Alec, who says, it doesn't matter who you are or where you come from, you are connected to people and land through your blood and your blood remembers. So think about your own ancestors that bring you to this place today um, and to this work, to this pursuit of equity and justice and reimagining the system that could be. Jamila. I wanna add in another acknowledgement for us. Growing up in my own household and community, there were ways that we always acknowledged our ancestors and they were twofold for me. 
um, in celebrating Kwanzaa, we always poured libations for the ancestors um, through the seven days of Kwanzaa. And also my family members, my friends, my cousins, we always did a little bit of pouring out a little something for our folks who had passed uh, away. So I wanna bring that into this space because when I am sitting here with you all, I'm sitting, standing on the shoulders of Miss Ida B. Wells and Maya Angelou and my Babu and my Madeer who all came before me. And there's someone who came before you. So I just want you to take a second. If we were together, I'd have you start calling out names. And I'd say Ashe after every name that I heard. But I want to give you the opportunity to just think for a second about folks who have come before you. And this quote kind of helps us. The ancestral knowledge is always flowing through us, whether we are conscious of it or not. Our cultural expressions always have a way of manifesting itself in our lives. It's only when we look to the past that we can find its origin. Please call up someone whose, whose shoulders you are standing on today. And I see some folks here too, Carrie, Eliza, Gloria Ladson Billings is an elder whose, sh whose shoulders we're standing on. Arturo, Charlotte, Barbara, Frederick Douglass, Ashe to all of those people, Shane, Ashe. Say, thank you, Jamila, beautiful. Keep them coming, you know, you can look at each other's um, shout outs as well in the chat. <clears throat> and it would be remiss of us to not call in our amazing esteemed guests. We are just so honored to be joined today by Dr. Christopher Emden, Dr. John Mehta, um, and I'll just say a word about each of them. They really don't need much introduction. They're such uh, big, important folks on the scene. But, you know, Chris um, is the author of For White Folks Who Teach in the Hood and the Rest of Y'all Too, a phenomenal book. Uh, he's a professor of science education at Teachers College Columbia and the director of the Center for Health Equity and Urban Science Ed. And on a personal note, I first met Chris from afar on a stage at the New Teacher Center Conference years back. And there on that stage, I was introduced to this dynamic framework he calls reality pedagogy and the seven C's, as well as stories from his parenting journey, which resonated with me and from his classroom experiences. And I was quite simply just blown away. Beyond his transformative ideas, I was introduced to an educator who leads with a fierce humanity and a spacious heart and who calls all of us in to become better versions of ourselves in this work. As the person who authored the stunning forward to this book, we are just so honored, Chris, to have you join us today. And we'll be asking some questions of you later. And thank you again for being here. And then John Mehta, dear friend, um, author of the amazing book, In Search of Deeper Learning, which just came out last year, professor of education at the Harvard Graduate School of Ed. I got to know Jal a little more recently as a participant and speaker in his Deeper Learning Dozen community of 12 districts from across the US and Canada that come together multiple times a year in pursuit of systems transformation, equity, and deep learning. And I'll just say that watching Jal facilitate conversations in this community is watching a master teacher at work. He is so deliberate in his lines of inquiry. He is gently tenacious in how he pushes folks to think more deeply. And he's just oriented toward a radical inclusion of different voices and perspectives. So we are just deeply humbled to have Jal here with us as well. Much, much love to both of you and can't wait to get in conversation with you. Dr. J, a little bit on your why. Yeah, of course, I should share with folks who I am, right? I think that's probably important for folks to know who these authors are. Um, and I think it's important to share with you all just a little bit about my why for this work and um, as you can see, there's three people here, and these are my children and my lovely partner, um, Frederick. And I have to say that for me, it really comes down to something pretty simple. What does the world look like if my children, if Black children, if all children were free? That is the question I'm asking. It's the dream I'm chasing. All I want to know is what it would look like if we were all free. So I spend my time thinking about that. My children are my guiding light in thinking about that. My partner in this work helps me drive um, my mission around this. And so I think I would just say to all of you all, thank you for being here. You are my why as well. And anyone who is in a classroom right now in front of students, you are the why. You are the why. That's all. Beautiful, thank you. And a little bit about me, um, for folks who I haven't had a chance to connect with in the field, I'm a former high school teacher and principal 
who came into the profession at a really different moment before NCLB on the heels of a small schools movement where schools like Urban Academy and Central Park East were shaping a vision of possibility in the world. And I watched with a really, really heavy heart as the test and punish era began to cast a shadow over the field and just an eroding sense of possibility. A lot of that is what fueled for me the crafting of this book in the last few years. I'm also a white woman of Irish and Jewish descent, part of a proud lineage of working class immigrants who came to the States and formed multiracial urban communities before assimilation and redlining and gentrification really started to reshape the footprint of those communities. And I think those values kind of live in my blood and what I care about. And finally, I'll just say I wrote this book for my own babies, who you see here, Mona and Maximo, <laughs> who are um, multiracial children and also neurodivergent learners and who have not always thrived in a system that's built around white supremacy and the quantification of intelligence. Um, so that's a little bit about kind of who we are, where we come from, and, and how we come from a sense of why um, into the work. And we thought uh, it might be helpful to call on the voice of an elder who actually lives in Oakland and my community, um, Angela Davis, former Black Panther and writer and thinker and activist, um, to capture the spirit of this book, right? Ms. Davis says, you have to act as if it were possible to radically transform the world. And you have to do it all the time. This book, Street Data, is about radical dreaming. And it's about cracking open spaces of possibility, um, first and foremost, in our minds and our sense of imagination. And so with that, back to you, Dr. J, for what we're up to today. Well, part of our purpose is to spark imagination yet again, I'll say that. Um, it's mo really, really important. Um, but we're gonna do three things with you all. The first is we're gonna try to examine some of the roots of our current system, the paradigm we've had around data um, for the longest time. We're gonna explore the street data model. That's why you all are here. Talk about this idea, this, this model for equity school transformation and pedagogy. And then we're gonna engage in some dialogue. We're gonna talk to Dr. Emden um, and Dr. Mehta about these ideas and hopefully answer some of your questions later. That's what we're up to today. Awesome. So let's get into it. Enough build up, right? So the first section of this book is called Why Street Data? Why Now? And we wanted to kind of start there with this, this deeper question of why this model. So we're going to invoke the words of National Youth Poet Laureate Amanda Gorman, who recently said, it's because being American is more than a pride we inherit. It's the past we step into and how we repair it. For us, you know, we see ourselves at this turning point or this crossroads in the field of public education, a moment of reckoning for the soul of this country in many ways, and definitely for the soul of this educational system that all of us work in. Whether our schools can be transformed depends in many ways on our ability to tell the truth about the past and the system as it exists right now. The roots of our current approach to what is data which emerge from a history of white supremacy and even the eugenics movement if we dig far enough down. A painful past around structural racism continues to shape so many modes and approaches to the work, to what we call improvement, continuous improvement, even equity. And for Jamila and I, we wrote this book because we felt like the field was just trapped, kind of like paralyzed in this outmoded, in many ways, very oppressive model, and it was hard to see our way out. So we want to take a moment to kind of provoke your thinking with a couple questions, and I'll be asking Colleen on Dahl and Chris in a moment too. First of all, what if we told you that what is measurable in the field is not the same as what is valuable? What is measurable is not the same as what is valuable. And yet we've inherited and in many ways our practice day to day upholds through our actions an entire infrastructure based on this notion of measuring and classifying learning. I mean, you all could put this in the chat right now. There are so many examples in our system of where we assume that because we can measure something can kind of tame and organize it into numbers. It becomes valuable right so test scores are the most obvious. <laughs> 
but we could talk about number of standards you can check off, right, in your curriculum. We could talk about the pace, right, at which we teach the quote unquote content. We could talk about the progress of subgroups, all this language that's deeply naturalized right now in our educational discourse. We could certainly talk about grades, right? Jamila and I have been doing some kind of agitation on Twitter around grades, and that's a piece too to think about this. And in street data, we try to argue that, you know, this is a fundamental attribution era error. We are not trying to say that big data doesn't matter. There certainly can be a value in tracking things like graduation rates and college access rates and reading. But our systemic obsession with one narrow type of data, right, has created this kind of myopia <laughs> that at its worst dehumanizes both children and educators and devalues the cultural wealth, wisdom, and natural genius of every child, right? Conversely, we diminish the value of things we cannot neatly quantify, like joy, to cite Goldie Bahamut's work on historically responsive literacy, like cultural residence, like deep thinking and deep learning. And so we wanted to begin here with really the kind of deeper why of the book. And I'm gonna turn to you, Jal, and ask you to comment on this provocation um, where do you enter this conversation around reframing what it is that we value in education and when we talk about data? So first off, I just want to second what Dan said. Um, for everybody out there, this really is a paradigm changing book. Um, so that is, those are not words that I throw around uh, lightly. And it's written with such sort of verve. You're like, your heart starts beating and it makes you like, yes, I'm like going over a wall with Shane and Jamila. Um, so I just wanted to pass that on to the audience. On the, on the question, I really think that this is a sort of huge problem uh, in American education. Um, when I watch my own kids, I feel like there's always a distinction between uh, performance and learning. And so performance what is what's measured. So like, you know, there's some assignment and you get a point for this and a point for that and a point for this. And the purpose behind the points was to get you to, to write or develop a well-rounded thing. But then the points become the sort of obsession in and of themselves. And then I think if you take that out to a macro level, I think we're, we're working for the data when the data should be working for us. Um, data should be a way to inquire into your practice as part of a sort of reflective humanistic enterprise, something that people use to make better decisions. And instead it's become kind of like a prison that um, guides all uh, decisions. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Saul. Powerful, I was writing down notes as you spoke. Um, and Chris, how, how does this concept sit with you? This, this idea of what's measurable is not the same as what's valuable. And, how is it related, if it is, to your work around empowering neo-Indigenous youth? Um, I, again, I want to I want to echo Jal's sentiments. The book is just fire, and uh, Jal, it's good to see you again, brother. We had a talk early on in the, in the year, and so it's just good to see your face. And I'm glad you're well. So, so questions like these I find intriguing because even the concepts of measure and value are deeply subjective on their own. So what holds value ba is based on the perspective of the seer. And we exist in a world where the person who is looking at the object or the phenomenon, particularly within a very particular sort of capitalist structure, is always interested in amassing some wealth, some knowledge, or some position. So if my interest is amassing wealth, knowledge, and position in a society that presents those things as being finite, then it's in my interest to attribute value to what I have and to, uh, to attribute lack of value to anything you hold. But in value in itself never becomes something that is equally attainable or, or equally has a, 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 a substantive um, um, uh, effect on the life of an individual. Value then becomes a thing I can hold that I can utilize to put me in a better position than somebody else because in society, having better position is what holds value. So for me, I, I think we have to sort of like deconstruct the notion of what has value you know, recognize that value is subjective and then, and then deconstruct the notion that the amassing of a certain thing means that, 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 you, that, you, that you're better off than somebody else. Um, and so like in my hood, for example, the ability to be able to raise my voice at a particular volume 
is a necessary skill set for survival. If I go into the projects and my man's lives on the 24th floor, I want to be able to project my voice when I said, hey, yo, so he can hear me and have a resound for blocks and blocks and blocks. And so in my hood, the ability to be able to raise my voice and have inflection in my voice has a particular value. If I go to a school and I'm talking to my teacher and I, my voice raises loud and my teacher says, that's annoying or that's disruptive or could you tone it down? All of a sudden, what had value in one context has an absence of value in another context. Does it mean that it is not valuable? No, but value is subjective. And so a person with power can attribute value to one thing versus the other. I think what street data does really brilliantly is it forces people to start questioning the notion of valuable and value, multiple values, what is valuable within a particular context versus another. And most importantly, how do we reimagine spaces of power where knowledge is exchanged to allow for value to be redistributed, reimagined and recalibrated to be able to bend itself to the needs of the most marginalized young people? Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I hope y'all are tweeting all these gems of wisdom that are being dropped already in our first 20 minutes. So um, just I pulled up this little tweet uh, from a while back from my son, my sixth grader, when I was putting some stuff out about grades and getting a lot of uh, feedback, if you will, on Twitter. And I just love what my son said at 11. I would honestly remove grades completely. They don't say how smart someone is. They just say how good someone is at getting grades. A human mind is too complicated to be put into letters or numbers. <laughs> and if that doesn't encapsulate, again, the oversimplification of these systems, these Western systems, again, rooted in white supremacy, where we think everything can be measured and classified, and we know, we know students' brilliance is so much more complex than that. We know that it's so many layers, right, uh, to actually see and understand what a child is learning and grappling with. So we just wanted to end this little piece here on why street day. There's so much more we could say, but it's, you know, a short hour together by lifting up a couple of the, alter the other epistemologies that sit underneath this book. So indigenous ways of knowing in this stance of holism is a core part of chapter one um, in the book. And, you know, street data is really aspiring to offer other ways of being, knowing, and learning. And so one of those is the notion from um, Cindy Blackstock, Terry Cross, Indigenous child wel welfare folks, that in the human experience, everything is connected. We cannot separate our emotion from our mind, from our spirituality, our sense of purpose in the world, from our bodies and how we somatically experience everything from trauma and stress and racism to hope and learning and joy and flow. And so just this notion as we're going back to school, how might we lean into this um, holism and the kinds of learning experiences that we create for young folks? And then Jamila to you. Yeah, the other piece around epistemology is that one of the, we, we really try to lift up what is already there. We have had scholars since the dawn of time talk about and teach us about how we could teach kids, teach each other, build our communities. And so this picture represents all of these amazing women. I bet you could call out some of them. Dr. Gloria Latson Billings is there. Dr. Lisa Delpit, Dr. Joyce King is there. All these amazing women are contributing to scholarship right now and they've been doing it forever. So what we tried to do in this book was to lift those voices. They've been there screaming, shouting forever, but we need to bring that to the center when we're talking about education and what we value, what we consider to be valuable as we seek to do, do some change. Um, so let's talk about what this whole idea of street data is. <laughs> let's just like define it at a base level and then we'll get into some examples of it a little bit later. So what is street data? Really simple definition. Street data is the qualitative data that emerges at the eye level and on lower frequencies when, you train, when we train our brains to discern it. It is data that is there on the daily. It is not far, it is the moment of knowing we see in our children. It is that observation where we look and we say, this teacher's got it. It is the day-to-day -day data that's all around us. To make it a little bit more broad and specific at the same time, if you think about um, our current paradigm, we kind of start really high level. Think of Google Maps, right? You see the satellite, 
gives you some information. You kind of know where the countries are and things of that sort, but it's, it's high level. So SBAC scores would count as that. You get this data, everybody does all their learning. At the end, we find out that we were successful because the SBAC told us so. Here in, here in Philadelphia, that would be the PSSA, High School Keystone. Or we look at graduations. We were successful because this amount of kids graduated. Or how many kids um, you know, came to school. Satellite data is helpful to some degree. But then you think about Google Maps and you go to the map data. All right, now you can see kind of the freeways. You see a little bit closer what you need to see. It gives you some information, help you know the, you know, the route you might take. And we think of that in schools as maybe your student family surveys, really, really beneficial, Likert scale, kind of give you some open-ended information. Common assessments can be helpful. I love, you know, reading assessment, to be honest. I, I love that kind of stuff. But it only gives me some of the information. What we're arguing is that we need to get to the street. You know, you're wondering what the restaurant looks like. Well, when you go on Google Maps, it shows you what it looks like. You can see the numbers. You know exactly where you need to go. That's street data. For us, when we think about education, that's the interview. You did this lesson. Well, what did the student actually think about that lesson? What was the impact of the lesson on the student? Even beforehand, what is the, how does the student think the lesson should go? That's interview that we can do. Analysis of student work. The amount of times I've heard teaching happen, but a review of student work not happening at all is outrageous. Street data says the story, the work, and the broader community. It's home visits, it's focus groups, it's community walks. It's all the, the golden nuggets that are there when we train our eyes to be right at eye level. Brilliant. Satellite data, I just wanna say, we haven't made it clear, has some issues, okay? <laughs> satellite data is a little bit late, okay? My son was in class yesterday, and you wanna tell me how successful he was, I don't know, the end of the year? I can tell you right now, my son wasn't paying attention to half the classes he was in today. But if you wanna use the assessment, you know, the PSSA later to tell you, you know, whether he was into it or not, you can, but it's lagging, doesn't help. It lends credibility to sweeping decisions far from the focus of learning. You, we all know the amount of decisions that are based on scores and how commodified students become, especially black students, students who are divergent learners, it's inappropriate. And satellite data can reinforce, reinforce single stories. When I see you in this bucket, that means you are this, and it's mostly negative. We're rejecting that. We're trying to choose st street data instead. Nice. So yeah, I think hopefully it's coming clear that street data is not just a shift in practice and what we do, it's a dramatic shift in mindset, right? And so we know that in many ways, the satellite sort of data system has reinforced deficit thinking, shaming, lagging, objectifying, and static with this core stance, particularly directed toward students at the margins, towards our BIPOC students with of what's wrong with you, what's the gap? Right? What's the gap that needs to be filled is kind of the um, implicit question all the time. And we're trying to reorient our thinking, our mindsets toward asset thinking, or what we sometimes call abundance thinking, right? Um, toward modes of assessment like project-based learning, like um, performance-based assessment, like reality pedagogy that showcase student genius, right? toward data that's immediate and agentic, gives students a sense of agency and possibility and dynamic, right? And the ways that we can use it with this fundamental question of what's right with you, right? What's rich and beautiful and brilliant about you and your family and your community? And how do we anchor our teaching and learning in that? Back to you, Jamila. So to make it concrete, I think about a student I had when I was a kindergarten teacher who was throwing chairs in my classroom. And I made a lot of assumptions at first about why he was throwing these chairs. As I got to learn more, I found out that he just had a brand new baby brother. And that baby brother was getting all the attention. He was really upset about that. That was his story. So important for me to tune into that lens, that street data. Artifacts, as I started to observe him in my block center, which is where he was happy. I got a chance to see him scribbling notes. I found out in the block center that he was figuring out how to make habitats for insects. That work from the uh, block center he was in is an important artifact because it let me know this kid is into insects. 
really, really important. As I started to do guided reading with him in the classroom, I now had his story about what was going on in the background in his life. I was able to capture some informal pieces of work from him. And in guided reading, I brought those two things together. When my principal came and observed me, this is where she saw my point of impact. Not in the data way later when he learned to read and did a fantastic job, but she paid very close attention to the way I was executing this reading instruction on the day-to-day -day basis. That is street data, story, artifacts, student work, and observation. I wanna give you all a chance just to pause and reflect because we've been doing some talking and just to think about your community because you're all in different places. Um, what is a type of street data you could gather in your community? Feel free to put it in the chat if you would like to, but we did want you to pause um, and reflect because as we said, street data is a day-to-day -day thing and I think it's, um, you have the opportunity to, to collect it now. Oh, I see some good stuff coming. Yeah, out. creative writing, samples, knowing the strengths of kids, figuring that out, daily check-ins, family testimonies. Yes, I used to check in with my families every six weeks and ask them what I was doing wrong. <laughs> um, casual conversation, whole bunch of student interests, figuring out the interests of kids, panels, asking questions, morning talking circles, so important, so many things. So I just kind of shared what street data is. And um, Dr. Emden, I'm really curious from you. In the forward, you kind of say that street data is Wakanda-like. Like this approach reminded you of Wakanda. And I was just so like, Shane and I like took that. We were like, what does he mean by that? That is pretty amazing. So <laughs> could you share with us when you wrote that street data, that approach um, was Wakanda-like, tell us what you meant by that. Can you hear us? Okay, good. <laughs> Jamila, you might need to ask the question again. I'm not sure if it came through the audio. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay, so I was saying in the foreword, you wrote that street data is Wakanda-like. Yeah, you said it was Wakanda-like. And I am just wondering, can you draw out this comparison for us? What did you mean by that um, when you gave us that gift? I, I apologize, I didn't hear the initial question, so please forgive me. But yeah, you know, I mean, the, the metaphor was so powerful to me. When I read the book, it came to me so, so blatantly. And I, you know, in Black Panther, I remember Wakanda was this sort of magical land that was technologically advanced beyond anything anyone could ever imagine. They had the force within that nation that could, could change the world, but it lay right beneath the surface. And if you flew over Wakanda, you couldn't see it. But once you got there, you realized they were way ahead of where everyone else was. And, and I'm even gonna challenge you, sis, and what you said, Jamila, because you said, you know, I understand, like, you know, when we say street data, we're thinking it's like low, training ourselves to look on a lower level. And I would make the argument, that it's, actually, it's actually aligning ourselves to a higher level, a more sophisticated understanding, a, um, a, a more, a more, a more in-depth and nuanced and reactive and nimble way of gathering information is what emerges from young folks. And I think that sometimes even our language is, has been colonized by the power structure to make us frame what we know is more in depth and more profound than what they have to offer as less than what they have to offer. I'll tell you this in a second. You know, if I want, there's this one, I'm gonna stop real quick because y'all gonna give me the preaching. But I remember one of my favorite rappers was Cannabis and Cannabis had this one rhyme on his freestyle on Hot 97 around 06, 07. And he said, he said, I speak at frequencies dogs will have trouble hearing. Cannabis is the lyrical version of German engineering, right? And I was like, whoa, right? But what he was saying was like, I, the, the way I engage in the world with the communities who understand what I'm saying, it's such a high frequency, dogs couldn't hear. 
I am the lyrical version of German engineering. When you think of engineering, you think German engineering is the best. I am more complex and layered in depth and nuanced with my wordplay and my, my, the way I engage in scientific discussion in my construction of words. It's comparative to German engineering. It's a, and, and I think what we need to do is train the world to step up to the level we operate within and to own the sophistication of emergent data that's coming right from young people. And, and, and also to highlight the superficiality of the, the data that already exists. Like I can't get with that because it's trash, beloved. Like I need to get to the street so I can get more nuanced stuff. And I think some, like we got to get to the point where we are, we are, and Rashademic, we are honest, straight up with highlighting the deficiencies of the existing system without adhering to this linguistic tradition that makes us position ourselves as less than. What exists is whack. It don't work, it's trash, and we need to engage in street data approaches because we need new approaches to connect them with young folks who've been historically marginalized that we know are genius, period. I put a T at the end of period. And I think, it, I think unless we're that unapologetic and highlighting the deficiencies of the existing model, we will never see the vibranium in Wakanda while it lays beneath our noses. Love, 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 so much love. All right, take a breath, everybody. <laughs> you got a, the echoes, period, in the chat. We're gonna move into our last little slice of content, and then I think we'll still have a good 10 minutes or so for, for Q&A, because we wanna be able to engage with some of your questions, your real-time inquiry that's coming up. The second section of this book is called Choosing the Margins, right? This is, um, this is chapters three and four in the book. And um, that section is rooted in the core stance of anti-racism, which Jamila is going to speak to, and then we'll bring a little more content. Yeah, so I think a lot of people are just trying to figure out how to uh, operationalize this idea of anti-racism. And the core stance uh, comes from Ibram Kendi. He said, the opposite of racist isn't not racist. It is anti-racist. What's the difference? One endorses either the idea of a racial hierarchy as racist or racial equality as anti-racist. One either believes problems are rooted in groups of people as a racist or, or locates the roots of problems in power policies as anti-racist. When we think of this book and choosing the margins, we are actively deciding to reject the current paradigm. And we are deciding to actively accept, and now I'm gonna take it from you, Dr. Emdom, a higher frequency. That is anti-racism. It is a saying, we're not gonna be neutral here. We are gonna to decide to choose those at the margins. That's where the, the vibranium is, if you will. Beautiful. And, you know, we have this little graphic here to just um, kind of point us in the direction, this idea of finding and choosing the margins, which are going to be different depending on where you are located, right, on the map. Um, Chris, when I saw you speak for the first time, I remember you talking about like the microcultures of blocks, right? I remember you talking about like the culture of your students in this elite private school and figuring out where the margins are in your community. That's your work, right? And there's no book, there's no playbook, there's no roadmap to really tell you all that. But what we can say um, is to echo this idea that in the street data framework, there's no neutrality when it comes to confronting and addressing the legacy of systemic racism in our schools. We are either bold and courageous in our will to reckon, right, with historical and current harm, including the ways that data and transactional pedagogy and all the oppressive systems um, are functioning right now, or we ally to face, minimize, and justify its impact. And so street data is giving us a way forward that is about asking who's at the margins of my community, how can I center their voices and their experiences, and then ultimately, how am I gonna share power with folks? So we'll talk in a minute about um, the equity transformation cycle, which includes really importantly, the idea of co-designing with um, students at the margins, with families at the margins. And so that cycle, um, actually I see my friend and colleague Alcine Mumby in the chat here blowing it up, I love it. And she taught me this term transformative empathy. So the equity transformation cycle, which is the kind of process tool at the heart of this book. When I thought about it today, Alcine, I thought about it is rooted in transformative empathy. It's the idea that gathering data is not a transactional act. It's actually a relational act to gather data. 
It is a way to transform power. And it begins in this book, in this story that we're trying to tell with listening, with deep, mindful, humanizing listening, with the mindset of radical inclusion so that those who have been historically cast to the margins are actually centered in our data inquiry. And then it moves into this idea of uncovering, how do we slow down and take an inquiry stance and get curious about what the data reveals to us so that we can reimagine, right? So that we can reimagine our classrooms, our buildings, our hallways, our communities with this space of creativity and in collaboration with the folks we've been listening to. Not for folks, but with folks in deep partnership. Um, and finally, the piece around moving, that it's, it's not enough to just have the vision, right? We gotta execute it. We gotta get bold and brave and courageous and we have to be willing to make mistakes. Um, so we talk in the book about kind of safe to fail, safe to learn experiments being a piece of this. I think Jamila, you had a question here, or no, maybe it's the next slide for Jal, is that right? Next slide. Um, I'll just say this one quick, and then I think if you wanna tip the question, you can, that, you know, just an invitation for those of you who are principals, APs, teachers, working at all levels of the system, the time for street data is now. Right? Our buildings are opening back up. There's no test score that's gonna tell us what is gonna help children reconnect to school, re-engage, overcome mental health challenges, overcome the trauma of systemic racism and police brutality. This is when, right, we should be out there doing empathy interviews, doing Kiva panels, which we write about in the book, um, doing student-driven projects, having listening campaigns. All of this data is available to us right now. Um, and so I'm gonna, Jamila, hand it to you to, to give the question that we've created for Jolly. Dane, forgive me, do you have that question? Cause it's lost on my, on my stuff now. I do not. <laughs> it's gone. I do not, but I think that we just wanted to ask how this feels connected to your work around deeper learning, Jolly, if I remember correctly. Sure. Um, well, I mean, the number one question I get about deeper learning is the incompatibility with standardized tests. You know, people say 100%, I'm with you as you think about deeper learning is at the intersection of mastery, identity, and creativity, doing rigorous, meaningful, relevant uh, work that builds over time. And then people say, have you given this talk to my boss, my boss's boss? Until they change the ecosystem, it's really difficult for me to do different work. And so what I think you're describing is in part, I feel like this is a message to people at the system level, right? Because the teachers are with the students every day. And so inevitably they can tell you that, you know, one child like works better if they're in a group and this kid is better with that kid and this kid, you know, can do these things that this other kid can't, like they can see that. But at the system level, the way people see is so uh, decontextualized and so missing all of that information. And so I think what you're trying to do in, in part, one, there's a lot of different uh, pieces of value to this work, but I think one of it is if we could get people who are not with the students every day to think that this is really the way that we should know and understand our students. And I think one way to just think about it is like, how would you want the system to know and understand your student? Like your child, like if your child is struggling, you want your child to get help. You want them to understand why are they struggling, but you don't want it to all be about the ways they're struggling. You also want to think about their assets. And so the question is like, how can we get the system to think like this? And I think, you know, a lot of, um, there's been a lot of things in the space about the shadow of student challenge where you, basically follow a student through the day and you realize that uh, they spend all their time sitting, they don't get much of a chance to eat, no one cares about their opinion, et cetera. And I think one of the things that's been valuable about this year is um, people have seen a little further. So it's not just seeing it from the student's perspective during the day, it's understanding what the family life, what the home life is like, et cetera. And I really hope that we can carry that way of seeing and thinking forward. Thank you, Saul. So helpful, thank you so much. So just two quick examples and then we'll kind of wrap up. Um, you know, again, as school buildings reopen or you move through these different incarnations of what teaching and learning looks like right now, you know, we encourage folks to try some student design challenges. Invite students to, at the classroom level, design and lead a community circle. At the school level, help you design a grading policy that is a whole 
work um, Design the perfect school day for the fall, or better yet, have them design the first week of school in fall 2021. Every student we're listening to is talking about mental health, social, emotional connection and relationships. Guess who knows how to build a week that actually helps those things flourish and manifest our kids right so let's like shoulder up with them and listen to them and design with them in the weeks and months to come and another example from chris's work is this incredibly powerful structure of cogenerative dialogues which we write about in chapter eight of the book and so i wanted to um, flip it to you for a final question dr e about cogens as a form of street level data how could this and other ways of kind of um, centering student voice and feedback transform our pedagogy Thank you for that question. And I always love hearing Giles speak and he, he so, so brilliantly is able to give like a really cool way to tell y'all like, yo, don't worry about um, what you're doing. Do what's right to do. Your principal's going to have to figure it out anyway. Uh, but, he, but he's so PC and how he gets it done. It's so lit. Um, you know, you know, cogenerative dialogues for me, you know, they're birthed out of Again, street data. I, I, you know, I didn't have the language to describe this stuff until y'all wrote this dope ass book. You know, um, you know, I, I would look at young folks in hip hop ciphers, and I would watch them position themselves in circle, equidistant from each other. Um, one person rhyming, one person finishing another sentence. This really deep listening to each other, beats in the backdrop to create a rhythm to the conversation collective effervescence when everybody finished each other's sentences. And at the end of it, they all became family and they were preparing for the next time they would meet. And I said to myself, the cipher is such an organic, generative way to engage in conversation and create community and get instant feedback about how you're performing or not. How amazing would it be if young folks can do ciphers in classrooms? And I, I didn't have the language to describe it as cipher, but the but then we started utilizing a framework from Ken Tobin, my doctor advisor, and some other folks we were working. I was like, yo, this cogenerative dialogue, if we structure it like a cipher, have kids in the class give feedback to each other and their teacher about how they're experiencing the learning. And then not only just giving them feedback, but then saying, let's cogenerate a plan of action for fixing that thing. And so the beauty of cogenerative dialogue is that it's a practice that everyone can implement. But the results of the dialogue will vary based on your school. That's street data, right? That you have a shared method to get organic new information. And then it also, and this is going to be a little bit of a shameless plug, cogenerative dialogues allow us to be able to see our students in ways that they couldn't be in the classroom. In the classroom, everybody got to be academic. When you get three kids with just you, organic conversation, they see you as a human being, you see them the same, they can now invoke a little bit of their, of their ratchet, authentic selves, and then you could build them to be able to construct a ratchetemic identity, which is an identity that is equal parts academic and thoughtful and meeting standards and ratchet, which is raw and organic and who they are. And then the goals of all schools should be able to create ratchetemic young folks. Um, and so we want to, we, cogenerative dialogues allow us to get feedback from young people on what they need and have them give us suggestions on how to deliver what they need and then create the space for them to be able to give their full Ratchetemic identities. Um, and Ratchetemic is my, my, my next book, currently available on pre order. Y'all need to cop that. Um, you know, I know the author, he's pretty good. Um, yeah. but it's about reimagining academic excellence. Let me tell you what I think. I think that literally, y'all should buy three books. Buy Deeper Learning by John Meta because it allows us to understand new ways of looking at teaching and learning. And what these folks who are doing is sort of really interrogative practices on what works in classrooms is. And he gives us all these amazing exemplars in schools everywhere. So you need to get that book to see the exemplars in the world. You need to cop street data because street data changes the framework. Now you got a language to talk to you admin about, yo, no, this is street data. These are these components of it. It gives you new, a new discourse to be able to pull out what's happening in John Meadows' book on deeper learning. They need to go buy Ratchetemic because that's the larger philosophy and framework around where we want to get to. And so like, I'm about to go on Amazon. It better be like, you get this one and then you buy this one and then recommend the book that one. Y'all need to just cop all three, like get hundred dollars in your budget or whatever and cop all three. Cause I really think these books speak to each other in really powerful ways. Um, and so th that's my thoughts on cogenerative dialogues, deeper learning and being academic. <laughs> Thank you so much for the plug and for the seamless weaving together of all these ideas. It's beautiful. I'm going to turn it to Dr. J for a quick closure and then we have time for a couple questions. Yeah, I was going to say all these things about what street data helps you do, but it helps you do that. 
what Dr. M just described in terms of students being able to be seen, really, really seen. Um, and I was saying earlier that my son didn't do half his work because he's not thinking about that academic stuff that he's doing right now. He's thinking about a whole bunch of other things that are just as academic, but maybe be a little ratchet. Maybe, maybe. Um, so street data helps us do all of those things. Choose the margin, humanize students, disrupt single stories, engage in rapid change cycles. It also helps us do something I wrote about, which is avoid equity traps and tropes. I'm a leadership coach. I've been a school leader and a teacher. And one of the things that can be the most disheartening is people are really excited about moving the needle on equity. And then they go write checklists. Uh, to, they go on checklist ratchet, ratchetemics. They're gonna tell you the pieces of how you do that. And they're gonna put checklists on it and then figure out how to observe it. And you can't do that. Street data asks us, helps us not do it. Or we say, you know what? There's a ratchetemics curriculum and we're all gonna purchase it. And then we're gonna, it's gonna be great. And that's how we're gonna get to equity. Or we're gonna say, you know, we, we understand, we gotta see kids but we're going to go ahead and see them and then decide, oh, we got to do intervention because we've seen that they really need a lot of stuff. And so intervention is the way you, you, you fix them. Um, so street data helps us avoid equity traps and tropes. And we think that that's just important to understand what's going to be in the way um, and what's going to be the, the landmine that can blow this whole thing up. So it helps us get out of that. I want to give some time to q and I don't know if there's some questions in the chat. I wasn't able to check it, but I'll turn it over to Dan, I think, at this point. Um, I'll help with that. This is Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Oh, Jeff. I have a few questions. Here's one. Do you believe that by focusing on street data, satellite data will take care of itself? Or is satellite data not worth our time to focus on? How do you see those two working together? Hmm. Who wants to take that one? I have thoughts, but I'll, I can go second. <laughs> I want to, but it's y'all book because I like so y'all let me know if I can or not. <laughs> I can start us off, Shane, just because one of my other favorite books, Culture Responsive Leadership, by Dr. Muhammad Khalifa, talks about the idea of being community centered and how your numbers, if that's what you care about, will go up. It's just not the focus. So I think we can satellite data can be useful, but it should not be the focus. You can go to schools all across the country that aren't talking about test scores the end the entire year and they do fine if that's what you care about. I would venture to say that's not the thing to care about. Um, but if you're if, if numbers are what's important to you, I can guarantee that if you're focused in the right place, that's going to happen. Yeah, and I just think that we have to start to really interrogate why we are so attached to this system of test scores. Why, right? I literally hear people, it's like real estate, resident, you know, like policymakers need to know why, 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 why? So for me, the way the dashboard, the color coding of the dashboard and all this kind of stuff, it's like, it's redlining. It's redlining in data systems. It is really stigmatizing communities. And we have to figure out if we're gonna keep it around how to greatly narrow its, its influence, right? <laughs> And, and really narrow how it's used um, and not have it have any kind of punitive impact. But to the other question about whether focusing on street data will actually increase, quote unquote, kind of satellite data, my answer is yes. When you actually center student voice, when you center a pedagogy of student voice, when you make learning more culturally responsive and sustaining, students improve on their reading they improve on their numeracy they improve on all these basic skills that we that we're testing them on but we're actually orienting our pedagogy to the right things right rather than to this once a year or three times a year kind of test but dr e what do you think you know i think people often like people love to construct these weird odd and ridiculous binaries right it's like there now it's street data all the other data is out the window. It's now useless. And it's not true. I, I think that, you know, I think that there are some things that traditional forms of data that we collect can help us with. However, they should not be driving all that happens in classrooms all the time. That's ridiculous. And so, like, I may want to find out what my kid needed, I mean, did not quite do well in last year so that I can ask deeper questions this year, right? So, so that in that instance, that the more robust data can give me a, a, a lens to which to interrogate the street data and find out more rich things. So it's not about replacing, it's about enhancing, and it's also about how do you use the data, right? 
Because, you know, here's the thing. Someone can use street data in a way that's problematic if their orientation is to identify what is a deficiency in the young people, right? That one kid said that that one kid distracts him. The street data indicates then that those kids are disruptive. So it, it's a matter of shifting frameworks and shifting philosophy and not usurping power by trying to dominate the existing framework. It's about a constellation of ideas and measures to allow us to be able to hone in more deeply in particular things to help the instruction be more robust for the young people. So not an erasure of existing methods, it's about usurping the power they hold to drive all things. And it's about shifting the larger frameworks on what we do with the information that we get about young people in the interest of young people. And that also connects to the point I was making about the data working for us rather than us working for the data, right? Like, I think people who don't know science think that data like makes decisions for you. Data is just a sort of like a helpful tool, potentially helpful or potentially distracting tool in reflection on how things are going. And so people have to make uh, decisions about those things. So in some cases, like if your street data helps you make your instruction more relevant or give students more agency, then your satellite data, say your attendance rates should go up because kids should be more interested in coming to school. But if you're, if in your school, your purpose is to do project-based history and kids do deep investigations of, you know, particular historical phenomena, and then they don't do well on a multiple choice standardized history test, which asks them, you know, a mile wide, a inch deep questions, that's okay. Like you're confident that they learned certain things about history that are connected to your purposes. And that didn't connect to what the other assessment is measuring. So just remember like we're thinking beings, like we are in control of this process. Beautiful. Milan, Dan, should we do one more question or just move to the closing chat? Uh, we have time for one more quick question. Can we also get street data from student reflections. So could students provide that type of data before and after instruction? 100%, yes. But the heart of this book, one of the chapters is about a pedagogy of student voice. And really that's in some ways, that's the most important data, right? Is gathering student reflection, narrative, written, interview, um, peer to peer. There's so many ways to do that, but I would say 100% yes. Jamila, what would you add to that? Nothing. A hundred percent. Yes. <laughs> Listen to the babies. They are wise. They, they can shed so much light for us, right? On our gaps, on our strengths, on what's, what we're doing well as educators, as well as, you know, the places where we can grow. Right. So I think I, I want to say this real quick too. I, I just want to, this is so important. I also love that y'all named it street data. Jamila and Shane, like I, I, you know, like you could, you could have named it like eye level data, you know, you're like you could have, you know, you could have, but I think there's something really provocative, powerful about saying street data, right? Like, you know, we, we know what the connotations are when folks say the streets, um, it, it, they're talking about a particular population. It comes with some perception about their inherent inability, the danger of it, how problematic it is. And then this idea of reclaiming the idea of the streets um, it's such a brilliant concept because it prepares the reader for the provocative um, sort of thinking that's coming in the book. And so I also wanted to commend you on the naming of the approach in embracing the concept of the streets. I, I, I love that. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. So if you don't have to run right this moment, please share a takeaway in the chat. So we have our, a little bit of street data from you all on what you're kind of still percolating with, what ideas stuck for you, um, a quote, an idea, whatever. And uh, as those come in, I'll turn it back to our Courtland colleagues. Terrific, I'll turn it over to Sharon, Sharon. Thank you, thank you, Shane, Jamila, um, Chris and Jal for this informative and thought provoking session. Corwin will be sending a recording of the presentation within a week. But if you would like to learn more about this subject, you are also welcome to use the promo code webinars to save 20% plus free shipping at www.corwin.com on street data, a next generation model for equity pedagogy and school transformation. Thank you for joining us today.
appreciate you all so much. And Jal and Chris, it's just great to be in community with you. I hope this is not the last time we get to do this together and explore these ideas together. Thank you all so much. You all are geniuses, pure genius. <laughs> Good stuff coming in the chat. Wow. Wakanda forever. <laughs> <laughs> Alcine, we love you too. You're brilliant and joyful. Thanks for bringing it. Fastest hour of somebody's life. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Transformational empathy. Jamil, feel free to read some of these out if you oh, want. Oh, you know what? My chat is. Oh, okay. Uh, wondering what our administrators would think or would allow. Good question to take forward as a change maker. <clears throat> I need more. Can't wait to get the book to see how to implement this. <clears throat> Cogenerative dialogue. Cyphers hoping to learn more. Get Chris's first book and Ratchetemic. Both and Ratchetemics. <laughs> I see it now. I see it now. Seems, doesn't even seem like it was an hour. Yeah. Folks buying the book over here. Keep up the good fight. Things have to change. Have right. to change. That's right. Jefferson County, Kentucky shifted their entire assessment system to collect street data. It can be done with bold leadership. Nice. Nice. I'll the see. cipher. That's for Miss Ford and Camden. That's one of my leaders over there. Thank you, Rakia. Yes, of course, Susanna, it's appropriate for pre-service teachers. It should be, it should be what they're using in their program, 100%. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, my auntie is on here. Hey, hey family. <laughs> also, so excited to share with my admin, Begin Transformation Today. Thank you for the additional book suggestions. Glenda, nice to see you, Glenda from EPAA. Excellent. We want to see, want school counselors to read this. Yes. Come through, Auntie. <laughs> Hi, Nikki, one of my teacher colleagues from San Francisco Unified. Doctor, she says, Dr. Earbrook is amazing. I tried Cogens a few years ago and got to bring it back. They work, and I love the changes in community they created. Yes. Nice shout out. Oh. Hi, Nora. <laughs> Y'all fill my heart. I feel so full right now. Beautiful. Choose the margins. Yes. Well, thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of the week. Corwin team, good job. <laughs> thank you. Bye now. Bye-bye.